Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming here. The last day, the last sessions, but the most important ones. We will try to explain, to speak today about the public transport planning cities around mass and transit networks. It's one of the biggest questions today in our cities. It's one of the key questions that we try to answer today with our keynote speakers this afternoon. It's clear that the, the governments have solutions in planning for public transport, but the changes in our cities today with the new models of mobility ask us to have new solutions for this kind of people, for, this, for our citizens. For this question, and because we try to get answers about big questions on our cities, like, for example, how to integrate the new systems with big data and with the public transport traditional, uh, by trains, by metro, buses, uh, how to link our model, the old one, with the new technology and the new performance of the new models of people going around, around our cities, cycling, missing, all of these systems that we are today seeing in our cities. The question is, uh, I, I only main, uh, make two big questions for our keynote speakers. The, fir the first one will be, what is the role of public transport in shopping cities, in our cities? And the second question will be, how can public transport adapt to emerging alternative form of urban mobility? For begin this session, we have a special keynote speaker with a long tradition, with a, a lot, a strong tradition of mobility, who is Mr. Ricard Fon, who is the president today of a, a train company of Catalan government, Ferrocarrils de la Generalitat de Catalunya. But before, he had been the vice minister of uh, infrastructures and mobility of the same government. That means he has a lot of experience about planning, about management, and get solutions for uh, this country, and in this case, Catalonia. Please, uh, it's your turn. Thank you. Yes. Muy bien, gracias por, uh, por la invitación. Uh, voy a intentar ser breve y para después, si hay alguna pregunta, explicarles cuáles son los planes que en este momento desde Ferrocarriles de la Generalitat de Cataluña estamos pensando para la movilidad. En primer lugar, yo creo que me gustaría destacar que en este momento, a nivel de planificación, hay tres elementos, tres cambios que, deter que determinan nuestra actuación. El primero es la lucha contra el cambio climático, determinante. El segundo, el cambio tecnológico, que nos ocupa en este momento para poder uh, avanzar hacia la digitalización de los servicios ferroviarios y de los servicios de movilidad en su, en su conjunto. Y finalmente, el cambio de escala. ¿no? Nosotros cuando planificamos la movilidad, cuando planificamos los servicios, ya no debe ser una planificación pensada en un ámbito local, sino que debe ser una planificación en un ámbito global. Esto tiene una aplicación práctica, que es que cuando nosotros planificamos los servicios entre una ciudad uh, y otra ciudad ya no estamos planificando entre una estación de ferroviaria y otra estación ferroviaria, sino que la planificación es desde que salimos de casa hasta que llegamos a nuestro destino final. En algunos casos puede ser entre una ciudad eh, mediana y la capital, o entre la capital y una ciudad mediana, o entre cualquier ciudad, y por ejemplo Hong Kong, o entre una ciudad y Shanghai, o una ciudad en, y Nueva York. Por lo tanto, esta planificación del servicio ha de superar eh, esta visión ex exclusivamente local para una visión global. Desde el punto de vista de la aplicación de las, uh, de las tecnologías, hay, yo creo que hay cuatro elementos que en este momento uh, protagonizan el trabajo que estamos haciendo desde el punto de vista de la tecnología. Primero es una obviedad, que es uh, la utilización de todo el Big Data. ¿no? Si ustedes, uh, cuando acaban esta sesión, 
pasan por el stand de ferrocarriles de la Generalitat que está aquí al lado, verán ustedes que tenemos toda una serie de aplicaciones que, en el, que se basan en la, en la integración de datos para poder dar servicio primero a los clientes, servicio a nuestra propia operadora, por lo tanto a los, a los uh, trabajadores, a los drivers, a los uh, uh, maquinistas de nuestros trenes y también para dar servicio a los que tienen que hacer el mantenimiento de estos trenes. Por lo tanto, lo que primero que es importante es la integración del Big Data para tener aplicaciones que tienen que ver con el cliente, que tienen que ver con la operadora y que tienen que ver con la infraestructura. El segundo elemento importante es uh, lo que sería el Small Data, que es tener un conocimiento real uh, de cuáles son las necesidades de la operadora. Y aquí es donde nosotros estamos uh, aportando lo que ha de ser el conocimiento de, primero, el cliente, aplicado a las necesidades del servicio y también aplicado, a partir de aquí, del servicio a la infraestructura. Esto en materia ferroviaria pues tiene a veces, eh, no siempre es tan evidente lo que les he explicado. Pues es decir, es evidente que primero tenemos que saber qué quiere el usuario, después aplicarlo a la operación de servicio y después al mantenimiento de la infraestructura. Eh, en algunos países, eh, Gran Bretaña, España, en menor medida en, en Francia, por ejemplo, la separación de la gestión de la infraestructura del operador hace que a veces la infraestructura no esté al servicio exactamente, precisamente, de la operadora. Y a veces pasa que la operadora, por lo tanto, ya no puede trasladar este buen servicio que el propio cliente nos, nos demanda. En nuestro caso, tenemos la suerte de que nosotros, a través de la, de la encuesta que tenemos con los, o con los clientes, la operadora puede programar un servicio que, a su vez, es el que, de alguna manera, comanda eh, lo que sería, eh, dirige lo que son las operaciones de infraestructura. Por lo tanto, cuando pensamos en mejoras de infraestructura, indirectamente estamos en pensando en mejoras que están eh, pensadas para el usuario. Por lo tanto, el small data acaba teniendo una, teniendo una traslación en lo que es la mejora de la infraestructura ferroviaria. Repito, parece una obviedad, pero en el mundo ferroviario, en el mundo de las infraestructuras, y en el mundo de la operación de servicios de transporte público y en el mundo de la movilidad no siempre es así, ¿no? Y por otro lado, el small data tiene otro elemento importante, que es que la visión que hemos de tener de la operación de servicio público no solamente debe ser la visión del usuario dentro de nuestro servicio, sino que hemos de saber qué le pasa al usuario desde que sale de su casa hasta que llega a un servicio, en ese sentido que nosotros uh, dirigimos directamente y finalmente qué hace cuando sale de la estación para tener una relación, por ejemplo, intermodal con un patinete, con una bicicleta, con un car sharing, con, una, con un renting o con, con otro servicio público que le lleva, como decía antes, a un aeropuerto o a un puerto. Por tanto, esto es una, un segundo elemento. El, elemento. el siguiente elemento de tecnología que evidentemente en este momento estamos trabajando de manera, yo creo, muy intensa y que esperamos en los próximos meses poder enseñar ya, uh, con, por ejemplo, con motivo del, del siguiente gran certamen que hay en Barcelona, que es el mobile, es uh, toda la aplicación con 5G. ¿Cómo vamos a aplicar dentro de la operativa de ferrocarriles de la Generalitat todo lo que es la, la, la tecnología 5G? También, si van ustedes a nuestro uh, stand, verán que nosotros la visión que tenemos alrededor del 5G tiene que ver que, también con cada uno de los elementos que les explicaba antes. El primero... El 5G nos va, a permitir, te, nos va a permitir tener una información directa de la propia operación en tiempo real. Por lo tanto, vamos a poder tener eh, una relación directa con el propio uh, maquinista, vamos a tener una, una operación directa con el propio tren que se está moviendo y con las propias estaciones en tiempo real. El segundo elemento es que a través del 5G podremos ofrecer, podremos digamos, interlocutar entre el centro de operaciones y el propio tren en tiempo real. Esto, aunque parezca también una obviedad tecnológica, hasta que no tengamos un ancho de banda 5G que nos permita tener la seguridad de que esto lo podemos operar, no es posible porque eh, los cortes del eh, 4G, en algún caso del WIF, etc., no nos permite garantizar la seguridad que necesita un transporte público ferroviario para esta relación, para este diálogo directo entre el centro de operaciones con el tren que se está moviendo. 
ustedes podrán ver que podrán ver en un aplicativo ahora el tren cómo se está moviendo, verán el, lo que ve el maquinista, verán perfectamente los, los, el maquinario que tiene la, el maquinista, la pantalla que tiene el maquinista, eh, cómo, cómo, lo que ve el maquinista por delante y por detrás, podrían ver lo que pasa dentro del tren en tiempo real, pero con tecnología 4G que no, es, eh, no nos permite eh, trabajar con esa tecnología para mejorar el servicio, pero con el 5G lo vamos a poder hacer. Y finalmente tiene dos operaciones más, tener un conocimiento real de lo que es la propia infraestructura y poder actuar en la infraestructura con planificación de mejoras en, también on time. Y la última aplicación, que es la más eh, sugerente, digamos, si me permiten la, la expresión, seguramente la más sexy, que es todo el, todos los servicios que podremos dar directamente a los usuarios que estarán dentro del tren y que podremos garantizar a través de la nueva aplicación. Y finalmente, hay otro elemento tecnológico que en nuestra planificación pues va a ser definitivo y que esto no sabemos si lo vamos a ver en tres, cuatro o cinco años, pero que sí que estamos empezando a, 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 de alguna manera, a experimentar, que es todo el tema de la inteligencia artificial. La inteligencia artificial para poder, sobre todo, resolver problemas. A la inteligencia artificial para poder hacer un mantenimiento predictivo. ¿no? A, si hay una cosa que va a cambiar absolutamente tanto el 5G como la inteligencia artificial, va a ser que las cosas no se van a averiar, sino que sabremos que están a punto de averiarse. Y, por lo tanto, podremos actuar en ellas de manera predictiva y podremos actuar, digamos, avanzándonos a posibles afectaciones de servicio. No, les hace, no hace falta decir que en una operativa de transporte público seguramente el atributo principal que para los usuarios tiene el transporte público es la sufiabilidad. Ahora podría decir que les hablo desde una compañía seguramente de las más puntuales, si me permiten decirlo, del mundo, porque tenemos un nivel de puntualidad del 99,5%, por lo tanto prácticamente es una puntualidad del 100%. Pero aunque estemos en estos niveles, eh, seguramente los problemas principales que tenemos para no ser 100% fiables es en pequeñas averías eh, que sufrimos en la operativa normal de, de ferrocarriles. Por tanto, aplicando Uh, la inteligencia artificial vamos a poder hacer, y conjuntamente con el 5G, vamos a poder hacer una predictibilidad en lo que es las operaciones de mantenimiento de la propia infraestructura que nos va a permitir ser mucho más fiable. ¿no? A partir de aquí, esto nos permite, como les decía antes, uh, de manera directa poder mejorar el servicio del usuario con, con más información, como información más precisa. Hoy los usuarios de nuestros servicios uh, pueden saber cuándo llega el tren, cuál, qué nivel de, de ocupación tiene el tren en tiempo real. Esto ya, se puede, ya es posible. Esto ya es una, que también pueden verlo en nuestro, en nuestro stand. Esto ya es un primer avance, pero evidentemente en materia de información tenemos que tener todavía un campo muy importante por recorrer para poder tener más información en el usuario. En el campo del mantenimiento, como les decía antes, es para intentar evitar, pues, uh, el, el tener que tener averías y tener que tener momentos en los cuales no podemos ofrecer el mejor servicio. Y en materia de operación es donde también tenemos un campo por recorrer, que es toda la planificación de la operación de ferrocarriles, teniendo todos estos elementos que les explicaba uh, perfectamente, dos parametrizados, monotirizados. Lo que les decía, el small data es para saber exactamente qué esperan de nosotros los usuarios, con una visión que va mucho más allá de la propia estación, sino que es de, desde que salen de casa hasta que llegan al punto de quieren ir, que quieren ir, que como os decía antes, eh, puede ser eh, desde que salen de casa hasta que llegan a un aeropuerto en otro continente. Segunda cosa que es importante es poder ofrecer los servicios en cada momento en función de la demanda que tenemos en cada momento. Y finalmente, también poder eh, comunicarnos con uh, nuestros usuarios, con uh, nuestros uh, maquinistas y con nuestros servicios de mantenimiento en tiempo real para poder solucionar los problemas de uh, cualquier problema que podemos tener y, por lo tanto, cualquier, hablo de problemas, pero podría hablar para poder dar una solución en tiempo real de manera más inmediata. Por lo tanto, estamos, tenemos uh, uh, a la vista cuatro elementos claves para los tecnológicos que nos han de permitir uh, poder ser mucho más fiables y además poder ser mucho más intermodales. Cuando nosotros ahora 
y con esto acabaría, pensamos en las estaciones de movilidad, no hablo de estaciones de trenes, hablo de estaciones de movilidad que estamos planificando, nos imaginamos estaciones donde la gente va a poder recoger el comercio electrónico que habrá eh, contratado durante el día, nos imaginamos estaciones que cuando salen de las mismas tienen eh, motos eléctricas, eh, motor sharing eh, para poder coger una moto, eh, car sharing para poder coger un coche, tienen eh, patinetes para poder desplazarse de la última milla, tienen bicicletas para desplazarse y tienen toda una intermodalidad con la cual pueden programar su itinerario. ¿Y cómo lo van a programar? A través de aplicaciones que les van a ofrecer toda esta intermodalidad. ¿Qué aplicaciones? las que muchos de ustedes van a generar y van a crear en los próximos años a partir, de, como les decía antes, de una Big Data que va a estar eh, Open Data y que va a estar a disposición de todos para poder operar y para poder planificar. Y esto va a ser una gran revolución. Uh, ayer, y con esto sí que acabo, ayer hablábamos uh, de una alianza estratégica entre un uh, constructor de coches que sabe que va a construir pocos coches en los próximos años y ferrocarriles de la Generalitat para uh, diseñar las estaciones del futuro. Y esto hace pocos años hubiésemos dicho que era una absoluta tontería o ocurrencia uh, bien intencionada en una feria, pero eso ya es una realidad. Es decir, un operador ferroviario está hablando con un constructor de coches que dice que va a construir pocos coches pero que va a ser operador de servicios de movilidad para generar una estrategia para construir estaciones de movilidad, cosa que es absolutamente una revolución. Revolución, que como, y con esto sigue a cabo, que tiene que ver no ya tanto en lo que queremos los operadores, que seguramente es seguir operando como siempre, sino que tiene que ver con nuestra capacidad de adaptarnos a las nuevas necesidades de la nueva movilidad, que tiene que ver con el último objetivo que perseguimos, que es la lucha contra el cambio climático, que en este momento, y la mejora de la calidad del aire, que en este momento en las regiones metropolitanas mundiales, pues seguramente son el primer problema que tenemos que solucionar entre todos. Con esto acabo, muchas gracias y espero que, que les haya servido para alguna cosa en mi intervención. Uh, muchas gracias, Ricardo. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, the change of the, of the stations will be the key in this model, I think. Well, in any case, the second keynote speaker now will be Mr. Deepak Agawar, who is a commissioner of Baranesi, chairman of a company who is Baranesi Smart City Limited. Only a few words about the city of Baranesi, probably not a lot of people here know this city. It's a city of one million and a half, more or less, uh, inhabitants in La India, five, uh, five thousand years old. It's one of the oldest cities in, in La India. And uh, it's inside one program that Mr. Desbeck will tell us, who is uh, about 100 cities from the government of India doing a smart city activities. Please, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me make two confessions. One is that I was not the original speaker you were supposed to listen. So I was the late replacement. And so uh, whatever time I could get, I just have uh, put together a small presentation. And second is that is the first time I'm speaking at any forum of this stature. So to say that I'm overawed and nervous would be an understatement, but still I'd like to do the best of the opportunity which has provided to me. Uh, I came here to Barcelona as a learner to see what smart cities around the world are doing. Uh, since the last two days, I've been hearing to a lot of speakers and I've been to uh, all the, almost all the stalls. And like a curious child, I was always type, kind of thinking that, oh, I could do this for my city, or I could do that for my city. A lot of ideas, products, innovations. But then I sat back and thought, that do, I, do my city require that? Because smart city means smartness may be different to different cities. Uh, it is a very, very contextual 
concept. I come from a city which is 5,000 years old. You can just Google that. It is one of the oldest living city, if not the oldest, rooted in deep traditions, culture, heritage. It is home to one of the holiest Hindu shrine, the Kasi Vishwanath Temple. It sits on a river called Ganges, which is the holiest river and the revered river, most revered river in India. Mark Twain, the famous poet, said, Banaras is older than history, older than tradition, even older than legend, and look twice as old as all of them put together. Maybe this is a hyperbole, but uh, documented history of Banaras is 5,000 years old. It finds mention in all our ancient religious scriptures, texts, which have been handed down for us to, by, uh, from centuries. In, and the most important thing about Banaras right now is that it is the constituency of our Honorable Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi ji. He gets elected from this city. This government of India in 2017 came up with a concept called Smart City Initiatives. Under that, 100 cities were selected to be developed as smart cities in India on a pilot basis. Varanasi was selected in 2017. And under smart city initiative, a portion of that city was first meant to be developed on a pilot basis, which was called as an ABD area or area-based development approach to develop as a template to be replicated across the cities. Let me give a brief idea about the city. The city spreads across 82 square kilometers. It houses around 1.4 million people but it receives 6 million tourists every year. Now you'd say, what kind of tourist? Most of the tourists are religious pilgrims, religious tourists from India, and about 0.5 million people come from uh, abroad also just for the feeling the exoticness of the city. So we have a lot of floating population. It also has three big universities. If there was a city which can be called as a city of temples, this, be, this would be it, it because we have more than 5,000 temples spread across the entire city. If you see the nature of the city, on one side it is bounded by river Ganges, and two sides it is flanked by two small rivulets. One is called Varan, uh, Varuna and the other is called Assi, and there is where its name came from, Varuna and Assi, Varanasi. Anciently, in ancient times, it was called as Kashi, and Britishes uh, called it Banaras. Now, when the smart city concept came in, we had a lot of stakeholders' consultations, and India has a lot of stakeholders. The people is a vibrant democracy. We have a rich tradition of what you call public representatives, public at large, shopkeepers, street vendors, auto drivers, uh, shopkeepers, industrialists, boatmen, a hell lot of people for us stakeholding, com uh, stakeholding consultations. And we identified two broad areas which could make the city smart in, the, as a, in a juvenile state. So first was a low-hanging fruit, which was cleanliness, solid waste management, liquid waste management, and stuff like that. That was relatively easier to handle. Next, come, next came traffic, which was one area we still are struggling and grappling with to find an ideal solution. As I said, that there were a number of solutions. When the smart city came in, on a daily basis, we used to do visiting cards from a number of companies. So we have X solution, we have Y solution, we have Z solutions. 
but those were solutions which were imported from other cities and which trying uh, were trying to you know put into a city which has a lot of heritage behind so we didn't want the citizen didn't want to tinker with the uh, heritage and the facade of the city and next was the heterogeneity of it one was that in india we have lot of heterogeneous traffic we have pedestrians we have cycles we have manual uh, tricycles we have motorized tricycles we have cars we have pushcarts we have competing for the same space of the road and as it's, as it's a very very old city the streets are not very wide so the same space is 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 is, is being uh, taken over by a number of uh, uh, transport uh, transport thing and we have a high volume of pedestrian traffic during the festive seasons and then there is there are 30000 street vendors concentrated in that tourist area and around the area around the main temples which compete again for the same space and then we since it's an old city we didn't had any formal parking areas in the city so what do we do the first thing was which came as a solution was have a efficient public transport system and among the public transport system after the success of delhi metro rail corporation if you have heard of that company delhi had initially had a share of traffic problems but after the metro came a lot of traffic was got dissolved so number of cities in india just lock and stock lock stock and barrel just picked up the metro as a panacea for all the evils facing the urban transport system so there were a lot of experts consultants who which uh, came up with their uh, own metro plan the big metros the light metros and various forms of metros when it was put forward before the public it was rejected it in just one go just they didn't want any underground system tampering with the city because it it has evolved it has evolved over layers and layers of city any underground excavation would have ripped apart the old that is heritage of the city so metro was thrown to the that is the metro project was thrown to the dustbin in the first go then other number of alternatives were suggested of a maybe a, a mass rapid transport system involving Uh, buses and also a uh, system of ropeways ropeways was one system we are still not you uh, know um, thrown the idea and we are just uh, thinking out uh, thinking about it and maybe uh, will uh, uh, see it in near future but what we did was then what we thought that let us think of what we have right now we have the streets and we have the vehicles and in the limited time what incremental change on experience we can give to the people so let us start with the basic and that way that is where our uh, streetscaping plan came into the picture so in the abd area we thought of this 10 items to be done in the first go to make visible the changes among the public so that it has receptibility of the other ideas which we want to which we wanted to implement one was equitable road space priority is per activity and volume channelized traffic flow reduction in delays one way movement pedestrian friendly pathways encouragement to non motorized transport intelligent traffic management non vehicle streets zones and smart parking but this way easier said than done if you see the cities if we do uh, since it's a very old city we have no uh, we don't have a concept of a, a separate commercial area or a business area or a residential area it has developed over time and it has grown vertically and almost all these spaces are mixed land use so there be how there will be a shopkeeper whose how, uh, house would be on on his first floor and be doing business in the ground floor so any 
attempt to make a road a no vehicle zone or a pedestrian only road met with a lot of resistance and in the first phase we took around 12 kilometers of road and eight junctions for improvement but due to the, and it was a tendered out project, we have awarded the project to a contractor, and it had stalled for one full year. It stalled for one full year. We tried to convince the, all these conflicting stakeholders that in the end, it would be good for everybody. They were apprehensive about loss of business. Where would they park their car? Because the, the same street was used as a parking street also, a parking place also. Then we had, as a smart city, uh, I'm, I'm both the commissioner of the city, uh, commissioner of the area, as well as the chairman of the city. So, as a commissioner of this city, I said that if we are doing wrong, let us at least do wrong for once, and we know that we are doing wrong. And after a lot of cajoling and convincing, we took two streets and three junctions in the first go, and we started improving that. I'll just show you the pictures of two streets. Uh, these are the concepts you have already listened to in, in your number of. Uh, so we broadly divided this, that is the crowded area, into three broad parts. One was just along the river, which was the river, riverfront Prisingchon, which had a very, very harsh regulation, where we laid a lot of emphasis on pedestrian movement no vehicle zones, one-way one traffic. And the second was a transition zone, which was slightly a lighter zone, which was between the, um, that is the outer part of the city and the uh, riverfront, which we called it as a transition zone. And the third was the city network zone. And this is how we categorize the priorities in this three different zone. In riverfront pressing zone, the emphasis was mainly on emergency services, that is the ambulances, the fire services, and the pedestrians. And in the, in the transition zone, the, uh, that is uh, the emergency services and the pedestrianization were balanced with some movement of e-rickshaws, uh, uh, two-wheelers, and some form of public transport. And in this, that is the, in the other city area, we had almost, except for the uh, cars, we had equal priority being given to other uh, various forms of other transport. Now, this is one street which I'm talking about. This was before what we had, and then we converted into this. And this got the public uh, you know, on our side. And then gradually we won over the resistance and started moving it. This was this is another street, and this this is what we did with this. It's, there was small intervention, but the kind of visibility it had with the entire city, it got all the sto stakeholders on our side, and we were able to push bigger things into the system. And we also had a traffic flow management, which was a, again a very, very low-hanging fruit, which didn't cost us much money, but was able to, initially, it was again, uh, there was a lot of resistance, but initially, after some initial pains, the people realized that the actual time being taken by them from going from point A to point B was lesser, maybe the distance, the travel was more, but uh, the, the time taken was uh, less. So, in a nutshell, I just wanted to say that at times, big solutions, are portrayed as a panacea for urban mobility problems in the city. But every city is unique in its own character, and every city has to find its own solution. And at times, the solution should not be equated with the amount of money which is being spent on it. As I said that we have not ruled out any public transport system, we are still thinking over the ropeway system because only, uh, uh, as per my knowledge, only La Paz a uh, city in Bolivia has, uh, f uh, has experimented with roadways as a mode of public transport system. But uh, that is some, some time away. 
but in the meanwhile, which we are still uh, new as a new as a city in a, this smart city concept. But this, in this last one one and a half years, this is something which we have done, uh, which we have done in Varanasi to improve the uh, traffic management. And uh, I think uh, in a in a, another year or so, we'll be taking the entire this ABD area under this concept. And a lot of uh, other experts, some some uh, someone, uh, many of them from abroad also have come and visited and have appreciated that uh, this low cost solutions have. Uh, Enriched the experience of all the people, be it the that is the citizens, be it the tourists, all the shopkeepers, and all the stakeholders. So this was my small presentation, which you could have uh, just mustered up in this short time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Deepak. Uh, he explained us a city with three key questions. One is density. 82 square kilometers, one million and a half. Second question, six million tourists. And third question, 5,000 years old. And he tried to, to explain us a very difficult situation for us, seeing the photos and the, and the graphics that you explain us, trying to build a new model of city step by step. I think it's a very interesting answer, and it's very interesting to know it from India. Well, now we begin the second part of the meeting, who is uh, moderator uh, Silvia Carrascon, Caso Ramp, sorry, perdona. Uh, hay que interrumpir la sesión, ¿cómo va esto? Hay un inter intermedio de tres minutos, 15 minutos. Ok, uh, there is questions in the, in the meeting, please for the two keynote speakers that we did before. Hay preguntas para los dos primeros speakers de esta tarde, por favor. ¿Alguien tiene dudas? ¿Alguien piensa que, es, que está todo bien? ¿Alguien ha, ha levantado el dedo? No. ¿No? ¿Nadie tiene dudas? Ok, aquí hay una pregunta. Por favor. Um, I've got a question for Ricard Fon. Um, in Spanish or okay, in Spanish and English. Um, ¿Cuáles son vuestros planes para realmente potenciar la intermodalidad entre el tren y los otros modos de transporte para acceder a las estaciones? Ya estáis viendo al, al cliente de puerta a puerta, ¿no? Entiendo. Entonces, ¿qué planes tenéis para fomentar esta intermodalidad entre otros medios como bicicleta, patinetes, etcétera? Um, what are your plans yes. to promote intermodality uh, between the, the train and the rest of micro mobility systems uh, in order to see the client as a door-to-door -door, uh, person? Hay dos problemas principales, o two problems. <laughs> uh, el primer problema es la regulación de una parte importante de esta movilidad, patinetes, uh, bicicletas, uh, organización, que hemos, lo hemos visto un poco en una situación mucho más compleja uh, en India, pero también aquí una regulación de cómo se relacionan uh, los nuevos medios de transporte o de movilidad, como puede ser patinete, bicicleta, etcétera, etcétera. Por tanto, una parte de, regula de, regula de regulación pública, digamos, de cómo regulamos toda esta movilidad y por otro lado la manera de, de poder eh, combinar todos estos servicios de transporte es a través de las plataformas di digitales. ¿no? Uh, todavía no estamos en el, realmente en el Open Data, o sea, no estamos todavía, que todos los operadores públicos y privados estamos, estemos, estamos poniendo toda nuestra información en la nube para poder hacer plataformas que puedan relacionarse mejor plataformas que pueden relacionarse desde una, como les intentaba explicar, desde una compañía aérea hasta, uh, hasta un operador de patinete, que parece, son dos cosas muy diferentes, pero si, tu, si tenemos toda la información, integrarla de ser fácil, ya sea por integradores públicos o privados. Nosotros lo que hacemos es poner en Open Data toda nuestra información en, las, en, la, en lo que serían los las autoridades del transporte, hoy en, en Barcelona, la autoridad del transporte metropolitano va a tener toda la, toda la información de la movilidad 
con transporte público a disposición, pero hay un paso más que es realmente que hayan uh, grandes integradores globales que permitan tener toda la información y que, lo, que el usuario pueda uh, contratar, pagar ¿eh? uh, en los servicios, planificar todos los servicios de manera interlazada. ¿Qué podemos hacer nosotros como operador? Poner toda nuestra información uh, en Open Data y para tanto a disposición de todo el mundo. Nosotros ahora, por ejemplo, como un ejemplo, Uh, hemos puesto en marcha el Geotren, que es una, la localización de nuestros trenes y la, que también nos da la, la capacidad de los trenes. Hace pocos días una, un operador, un integrador uh, digital, nos ha pedido si esta información la podían integrar en su, en su aplicación. Y le hemos dicho que sí, que lo, pueden, que lo pueden integrar y a partir de aquí este operador va a tener esta información. Y ahora el problema principal es de, de legislación respecto a las nuevas formas de transporte bicicleta y patinete, como ejemplo, y segundo, que, que los diferentes uh, operadores uh, se crean el Open Data y, por lo tanto, den la oportunidad de poder uh, utilizar los datos para poderlos integrar en una plataforma, plataformas que van a ser públicas, privadas, que, se, que van a cambiar en meses. Nosotros, por ejemplo, la nueva app que vamos a sacar de Ferrocarrils, ya no vamos a hacer ninguna presentación pública, porque eso ya es ridículo. Eh, van a cambiar las aplicaciones en, me, en semanas, en meses. Eh, cuando sacas algo al cabo de una hora hay alguien que tiene una aplicación nueva, por lo tanto, no nos preocupa quién integre. Y lo que importante es que tengamos una fiabilidad de los datos y que se, sea posible esta integración. Y a partir de aquí que con esta integración también podamos tener nosotros uh, un elemento importante que es información de cómo se comportan los usuarios. ¿no? Esto ha habido una, también una polémica desde el punto de vista de la de legislación. ¿no? La privacidad de los, de, de la, de las, de los datos de los usuarios eh, anónimos nos puede permitir poder, por ejemplo, planificar uh, las horas valle, las horas punta, con una fiabilidad mucho más grande que la que tenemos hoy. Hoy lo podemos hacer aproximada, ¿no? Ahora hago una pequeña broma para que uh, ahora que en Barcelona nos hemos acostumbrado a que tenemos muchas manifestaciones, uh, cuando nosotros tenemos que planificar el servicio, ya no podemos tener a veces el servicio planificado, uh, nos cambia porque si hay una manifestación, pues hay gente que viene de fuera y como vemos cómo nos viene la gente, pues podemos planificar la salida de los, de los, de los mismos servicios con, uh, pensando en, en la entrada y la salida, ¿no? Oh, pero esto puede pasarnos, por ejemplo, nos está pasando esta semana, los, el metro que nos lleva hasta, hasta aquí, desde Plaza España, es de Ferrocarril de la Generalitat. Pues la, digamos, la, la, los servicios, de, la demanda de esta semana es muy diferente de la semana pasada, porque pues hay mucha gente que durante más horas del día y en determinadas horas coge nuestros servicios. Los podemos planificar, ¿no? Por tanto, el Big Data... Uh, tiene esta doble vía, ¿no? Primero, poder nosotros hayan integradores y después que toda la información de los integradores la podamos tener nosotros también para planificar nuestro servicio. Y a partir de aquí, pues, poder ser más, más ágiles. Nosotros tenemos una máxima que es muy parecida a la, a la máxima de las compañías aéreas. Nosotros hacemos un mantenimiento de trenes pensando en que los trenes han de estar muy poco tiempo en mantenimiento y han de estar corriendo, o sea, han de estar en la vía. Entonces, tenemos capacidad de poder meter trenes en cualquier momento para dar una mejor, mejor oferta, para poder responder a la demanda. La información es lo que en este momento es decisivo para poder hacer este, este mejor servicio. ¿no? Digamos, la smart o la inteligencia a la hora de aplicar la, la predictividad es básica para poder hacer estos buenos servicios y la integración que, pueden, que podemos ofrecer a través del Big Data. Muchas gracias. ¿Hay alguna otra pregunta? Any other question, please? No, thank you very much. We wait five minutes for the second session. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying here with us at this lunch time and siesta time. Uh, feel very wel welcome to my beloved city of Barcelona uh, and to our panel about rethinking uh, public transport and how our city is integrating innovation. The uh, mobility sector, as you know, is becoming massively networked and integrated 
but still the smartest way of moving is combining public transportation with active mobility. In case you are not able of walking and cycling, please keep in mind these are the smartest ways of moving, then we can think of electric mobility or micro-mobility to combine it with public transport. Right now, many eco-friendly mobility options are available, and this is great because, as you all know, big cities in the world, among them Barcelona and Madrid, uh, we are facing important air pollution problems. Car-centric development concept for urban areas is totally no sense for this 21st century. Most of the cities are about to ban diesel vehicles, and it seems that electric cars may solve just a part of the problem, saving NO2 emissions and noise pollution, mainly. But electric car is not solving the generation of particulate matters, coming especially from the wheels and the brakes, as you know. And depending on the energy source, even not the generation of CO2 and climate emergency. On the other hand, we know that electric car is not solving the inefficient use of public space and the congestion generated just to carry one person, mainly, and the amount of accidents and injuries caused by the last century mobility system. In this context, may autonomous vehicles be useful to reduce congestion and accidents? If we had millennials' minds that consider that owning cars is not fun and not interesting anymore, could we think of a real scenario based just on demand services and ride sharing and car sharing options? Once we've got solved the easy payment for all the possibilities to move, many startups around the world are showing that new business models can facilitate people's life. In fact, they are becoming very popular among the, commu the commuting population because they are really focusing at citizens' needs. In order to maximize the benefits of innovation for the public transport system, municipalities and other public bodies support, should support the use of different public and private uh, modes of transport by offering multimodal transport payment mechanisms, promoting the uptake of new forms of public and private collaborations, and fostering, of course, the development of new ideas and business models. Let's listen to our panelists to get to know how Madrid is dealing with this issue, to understand what autonomous vehicles uh, can bring to our urban mobility problems, and to learn how special, uh, geospatial technology can help us to design and improve our transportation systems. We welcome, first of all, Lola Ortiz. She is the General Director of Planning and Mobility Infrastructure from Madrid City Council that will share with us the new strategy of air quality in Madrid. Lola, just to let you know, she has to leave to some urgency to Madrid after, just after her talk, but I promise to send her your questions um, afterwards. Lola, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvia. Uh, it's a pleasure to me uh, to be here today. Thank you very much uh, to the Smart uh, City World Congress and to Barcelona. To, to give me this opportunity to show you uh, what is the, are the new strategy that we are preparing and developing in Madrid. And I have a video uh, to show you all, all the, the, the main measure, please. For some time now, we've had a dream and it's finally time to make it come true. Today, we are launching a strategy to turn Madrid back into a city full of life. To make our streets a place for everyone. A plan to eliminate distances. To ensure that whatever way you choose to travel, it's sustainable. plan that won't leave anyone out. Designed to bring us to new heights. Because Madrid deserves to be bigger. More sustainable. More accessible. More efficient. 
smarter, and healthier. Today, we set out on a new path, a path that will travel together, moving ever forward towards a sustainable future in which Madrid is once again a benchmark in Europe and around the world. We want Madrid to be whatever you want it to be, a city that you truly enjoy. So, shall we get started? Madrid City Hall. Thank you. Uh, and in the video, you can see the, the, more, the, the, main, uh, in, the main measure that we are going to, to develop during the, the next four years. Now, of course, we are working in a new plan uh, for mobility, secure, sustainable, and uh, healthy, because we, uh, uh, we're main object is to reduce the pollution in the air that, we, we, that you, you know, like Barcelona, we have a lot of problems with the, 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 the air, the pollution of the air. And also, uh, the pollution of the air is very relation with the mobility. Uh, also, we would like to um, to get a, 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 a city for the for the people, no? to enjoy the, the city. And, and we are working now uh, in the plan. Uh, this is the I think that the, in the next year we can show you some of the measures that we have uh, implemented because now we have uh, now it just started and. And we only have the, the the main measures, but I hope that the next year we can we can see and we can uh, take advantage of the of these measures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lola. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, she has to go. Really. <laughs> okay. Now it's turn for Clement Ubourg. Oh my God, my French. Head, he's the head of autonomous vehicles at Keolis. He's coming from Paris, and he's promoting the trial of autonomous vehicles in real operating conditions. Clement, the floor is yours. Thank you. So let me present to you today uh, what Keolis is doing um, about autonomous vehicle, and of course, in links with the mass transit networks. So let me first introduce myself. I'm Clément Aubourg, the head of autonomous vehicle of the group, and one of my main objectives is to provide autonomous vehicle solutions to all the subsidiaries we have worldwide. For those who do not know Keolis at the time, Keolis is a French public transport operator, but we are basically doing half of our turnover in France and half of it uh, in the other countries. It includes Europe, Northern Europe, the UK, North America, um, China, India, and also Australia, and Qatar, for instance. So let me focus on the uh, autonomous vehicle activity. We consider ourselves as a pioneer of the uh, autonomous shuttle operation, and we work closely with all the other area of the group. Uh, being a mass transit network uh, operator, we would like to bring this knowledge and this expertise to this new area of autonomous vehicle. As a leader, of uh, operation in automated metros from 1993 in Lille, in France, for instance, and the tram systems, we are convinced that we can gather all the knowledge to bring it to this uh, new area. We want also to, um, to take the AV development to the next level by testing many different use cases to be able to provide a better service for all our passengers in the world. So as I said, we consider ourselves as experts in uh, the operation of autonomous mobility, but as you may know, it's a step-by-step -step approach. We start slowly with the first trial, and we've been uh, operating this vehicle from September 2016 in Lyon, in France, and now we are moving to different use cases that I will develop a bit uh, later. We still have a strong focus on safety, because safety is our main priority, as you can imagine, and we try to uh, make these services available for the people. You, I'm pretty sure all of you have uh, heard about the Google Cars, for instance, but who has already tried it? If you come to our trials, they are all free of charge and all open to the public, so we can share the result with you to, better, to be better in the future. 
We have many use cases, starting with the first and last mile connection, and that's where we put the link with the mass transit networks, because one of our objectives is to provide a door-to-door -door solution, public service for the passengers, so they can um, avoid taking their private cars to take the public transport. So it means basically, like what we did in Lyon, we are directly at the tram station, which is a mass transit network um, mode, and uh, we bring the people to the last mile um, where you can have uh, university campuses, you can have uh, business buildings also, just to give them a solution so they can let their cars at home and of course, as a result, decrease congestion and pollution. So we imagine this as a complementary mode with the other uh, transport mode, but it's uh, not the only area where we work. Of course, we have many challenges with this technology. The technology itself, to make it better and better in the future. The customer acceptability, because if the people are afraid to enter this vehicle, we'll have a big problem. And last but not least, the regulation. Just a few figures about what we have done so far. More than 80,000 kilometers driven, all of them with passengers on board. We can do many simulations, but what we do as a public transport operator is that we test it in real conditions. Many hours of operation, many deployments. We, uh, at the time, have 10 vehicles running in France and almost the same in the rest of the world. So it's something that is still going on and that, of course, uh, helps a lot to um, improve our knowledge of these technologies. So what are we doing with this vehicle? Well, first, we test new use cases, because to provide a real service to the passengers and to the cities, our main clients being the public transport authorities, we need to be sure of what the vehicle is capable of doing, what service it can bring. These are the use cases we are testing at the time, or that we have already tested, from the most complex one, the rural site. We've been in Waterloo in Belgium uh, last year to test how the vehicle behaves in these conditions go into technical details, but if you are interested, we have a booth uh, right outside uh, this room, and I'd be very happy to discuss it into details. But you can see all the different use cases um, we've been uh, through uh, at the time. And what we're going there, as I said, it's that we experiment in real conditions. And real condition is not only the wide streets of Phoenix in Arizona, where some of our uh, competitors or possible suppliers are doing some tests, we go in very narrow streets. This is in Lille, in France, and when I say very narrow, it means very narrow. The idea is just to understand if these vehicles are capable of adapting to the real world. In Europe, for instance, but it's not the only place where it's like this, we do have to deal with these streets and, and heavy traffic. This is just a photo of uh, Waterloo, the, the one I, I said, where we don't have had any uh, LiDAR markers, for those who know, and it becomes pretty tricky for the vehicle to get a very precise location, which is a key, of course, uh, for that. And we're also uh, working on the next steps. We have launched last week in Sweden with a Volvo, our partner, a 12 meters buses running only in the depot of Keolis, just to understand how the situation will be in the future. We also work on customer acceptability. This is key as well. In all the trials we have launched so far, we, we've done some surveys. And what is very important and interesting for us is that we've got a very high level of satisfaction, above 95%, which means that, OK, it's a free service, and we provide a, a new solution, an autonomous vehicle for everyone. But still, people are ready to go uh, in this vehicle, and they have an intention to reuse it. I can go through the details uh, and the areas of improvement, but as you may know, speed and comfort can be um, improved in the future. Let me talk about um, what we have done uh, in, in partnership with Mission Publique, which is a French company dealing with citizens' debate. We are a public transport operator. We work for the cities, but we need to understand what are the needs and the will of our passengers. So we made some debates at the world level, first in France and then abroad, in Canada, in Singapore, etc., to understand what was, the, um, what was at stake and what people wanted. And actually, 
most people are, are ready uh, for this vehicle as being, you, you've got some keywords, uh, focusing on the future of the freedom of a chance because we do have use cases for this and I'm pretty sure that in the future we'll have more and more vehicles like that, whether at the end of a, a, a line where there is no real service, whether by night, because, well, as you may know, bus drivers is a key resource, but in some places we have a lack of drivers, so we could provide a solution, though I'm saying it uh, be, before you ask, we still have safety drivers on board, and all of them have the bus driver license, but it's a good way to understand, first, the evolution of the jobs, and second, what are the, the key problems that we face today to solve them in the future? Uh, just um, something what is uh, very important, that in all the places where we've done the debates, most people believe that these services have to be ruled, let's say, uh, by um, local authorities, not by private companies. We are a private company, but we work for the cities, for the... Um, the, um, the public transport ne networks, including, of course, uh, the, mass, uh, the mass network, mass transit networks. And most people put their trust on the local authorities and national authorities to regulate, because regulation is also key. And we work with public authorities to make it possible. Just an example of what we do, but some people may know the Vienna Convention that many countries have signed uh, back in the 60s, but it say basically, if you have one vehicle, you have one driver, which is a problem for driverless vehicles, even though we could imagine having a remote driver. Still, it is something that is key at the moment, and we are working with the different governments, whether in France with the Ministère de la Transition Ecologique and Solidaire, in Monaco, in Belgium, with the uh, Road Institute, in Quebec, in Australia, etc., etc., because they need our inputs to better understand what they have to do to allow these kind of trials, because these trials, even though it's at 15 kilometers per hour, uh, up to five kilometers uh, routes, they are necessary to understand how we will manage and operate these vehicles in the future. Once again, as a complement of the mass transit networks, but still, it's important to understand it from the beginning. And so thank you. Just uh, another uh, example of what we've done uh, in a city center, for instance. Thank you. Thank you, Clement. And now it's turn for our third speaker, is Ian Kuppel. He's the International Business Development Ma Manager of ESRI, S S S S S S S he lives in Paris also, and he's working to make, to make smarter mobility a reality. Let's see how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Sound? Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm very honored to be back here for a second time to present. And uh, I have a lot to cover, and I'm going to do it very quickly. So I apologize if I'm speaking so fast, but uh, I want you to see all of I it. Am. Take your time. because if, OK. Yeah. All right. <laughs> First, I want to introduce a quick video about the geospatial cloud. We've all seen clouds like these and these. But there's another kind of cloud that's impacting your work and your life at this very moment. Whether you've heard of it or not, it's used by millions of people. By 90 of the Fortune 100, dozens of US federal agencies, scores of nonprofits, most national governments, and thousands of state and local agencies around the world. It's Esri's geospatial cloud. More than a network, it's a nervous system connecting everyone who's making sense of what sensors are sensing everywhere, every day. It's a geospatial infrastructure that helps you see things before they happen and manage things end to end. It helps answer big questions like when and what to deliver. Should you do this or that? How to plan? How to grow. Generating billions of maps a week 
Esri's geospatial cloud helps you to see what others can't. Because when more than 80% of big data is about location, to be data intelligent, you must be geospatially intelligent. Let's see what others can't with the science of where. OK. So whether you call us S3 or ESRI or environmental systems research, we, call, we talk about the science of where as providing a framework or process for sensing things and measuring to be able to visualize and map data and information and to understand it through analysis and modeling and for planning and design and ultimately for better decision making and even better to make action. So what we've seen today so far are lots of initiatives for taking action, and this technology is helping many of those organizations. Our flagship product called ArcGIS integrates all kinds of data. It's not just maps, but it could be unstructured data. Much of your data is locked up in spreadsheets or in filing cabinets um, and other types of documents. We integrate real-time Internet of Things, LiDAR data, even BIM data, and we're here uh, exhibiting with Autodesk showing about the, the BIM GIS workflow. ArcGIS, there are about nine common patterns of use. We're most well known for mapping and visualization, for being able to understand um, and, and, and map all kinds of things, but also for data management, to collect an inventory and uh, be able to manage uh, large data sets. More and more, uh, GIS is being used for field mobility to take maps out into the field and to be able to take observations in real time from the field. Monitoring, uh, tracking and managing and moving objects, stationary objects uh, in real time. Analytics, that's to be able to discover and to leverage information to be able to see patterns and trends. And of course, planning and design to do different scenarios uh, for decision support, um, constituent engagement, and I'll show some examples of all of these, and ultimately sharing and collaboration, bringing all the stakeholders together around information, much of which is location. So my first example is from the city of London. The mayor's transport strategy recognizes that 80% of all the trips in London will be made on foot, by cycle, or by using public transport by the year 2041. In order to reach this objective, they've created a solution uh, that they call City Planner. And they have segmented the city into over a 1,000 different hexagons, polygons, and they're collecting information for each of those little neighborhoods. So here's an, uh, a, a, a map showing cycling potential within London. And another example is look, looking at bus trips along certain routes. So this is a tool that's being used by thousands of employees within the city of London where they are exchanging information between the different departments and different stakeholders, not just within the city government, but within the community as a whole. In uh, Melbourne, Australia, this is um, uh, one of several maps that they publish uh, through open source uh, product called uh, Story Maps. You may have heard about Story Maps. We encourage you to, to try it out. It's free. And this is really to educate uh, the general public uh, to explore their public transport system. This map is showing, for example, number of trips per, per hour. This is an example that I discovered just yesterday, looking at uh, different bike sharing scenarios. There was, uh, a, this is a story map as well, but doing an evaluation of the performance of these dockless uh, bicycles um, in the city of Boston. And one of the examples of the map that they produced was uh, looking at uh, comfort. Bikers are interacting with uh, cars and with other modes of transport, with pedestrians. And so they have mapped out those areas where um, bikers are conflicting with other, with other travelers so that they can use this um, uh, to uh, reduce these high stress areas um, and um, identify the, the uh, important uh, connections that need to be prioritized for improvements. This is an example uh, from Denmark. 
Uh, Finbus is the public transport agency, and our partner Rapidus has developed a solution for on-demand or, or demand-responsive transport uh, for different groups. And so they, they have um, routing uh, solutions, but what if there is a demonstration or a road closure? Uh, being able to quickly uh, route around that um, is, is very valuable, and so this, the public transport agency is using this solution. We're doing real-time tracking. Uh, we can use machine learning to look at uh, different patterns and trends, in this case looking at traffic density over the course of a day. Monitoring using machine learning. This is um, an intersection and using machine learning to identify the types of vehicles that are entering and exiting um, an intersection. Uh, one of the exhibitors here is Mobileye. We're working with them to do real-time analytics with their computer vision technology to identify where are the pedestrians that are interacting with vehicles uh, to mitigate traffic accidents. So this is being used here in Spain by the, um, some of the bus operators um, to alert drivers when they're entering into danger zones. But ultimately, this is to create a data set that would inform autonomous vehicles uh, went to, to be careful when they're uh, entering areas where there are a lot of pedestrians that are maybe crossing when they shouldn't be. This is an example from The Hague in the Netherlands. Their public transport agency has created a real-time dashboard. So here, there are lots of bits of information in a single view. They can look at uh, the status of their vehicles. They can look at delays. Um, in, and uh, this, this is a very powerful way to convey information not just to decision makers, but to the general public. Here's another dashboard. This is Infrabel, the uh, rail infrastructure company of Belgium. And this is their dashboard uh, looking at delays. Uh, so they have key performance indicators. And on the lower right is the S3 map. And as you zoom in or pan around that map, the indicators change. So this is uh, a very powerful tool that they're using. Real-time situation awareness. I believe this is uh, Malaga here in Spain. So uh, this is a public uh, web site. And you can get information about incidents or cameras. Uh, you can see where the parking places are. Uh, again, a dashboard that is very flexible and can be used not just for public consumption, but internally they have other dashboards for operating their network. Uh, and then here in Barcelona, AMB is a, is a big user of uh, GIS or GIS or GIS technology, whatever you want to call it. Our partner, Nexus Geographics, has helped them to create this platform. So many different departments within Barcelona are exchanging information, each responsible for their own layer of information. Be being able to overlap, overlay that um, is providing a lot of uh, value to organizations to help them to exchange data and information more easily. In Valencia, they have a portal. <clears throat> and uh, one of the applications in that is their GIS portal. And so if you select that, there are a number of different services that are publicly accessible. And if I select the one on the right, mobility, I can drill down and see the, the, what's happening with the public transport network. I can select one line look at where the stops are, see where the delays are. And uh, so it's not just a route uh, journey planning application. It's, it's much more. Also in Valencia, they have um, a web service called Valencia Al Minute. And this is bringing together lots of sources of information around uh, mapping. So they can look at real-time traffic information. They can look at the transit routes. Uh, they can see uh, pollution levels. And, and many other things. And this, this is evolving um, with different stakeholders becoming involved. So here's looking at parking availability. Another technology is uh, building information modeling, or BIM. Um, we are working very hard with companies like Autodesk to integrate workflow so that engineers and designers can work with planners and decision makers. So in this case, it's the Grand Paris um, project uh, in the greater Paris area. They're, they're building two new metro lines. This is line 16. It's 10 stations. It's a, a huge uh, infrastructure project of 2 billion euros. 
to be ready in the year 2013. And so uh, Ile de France Mobilité um, is, is um, the, the main agency responsible and with their uh, engineering company Aegis, they're able to visualize and look at um, what are the planned um, designs and put that in context with geography. You can see it in context with the surrounding environment. And this is helping engineers and designers work with planners more seamlessly. I wanted to make the point that this is an open technology. You may know that S3 is a private company and we have software, but it is an open platform. We're using open standards. We produce and consume open data. And we're using all, all the different open science methodologies. Uh, we have a lot of open source components in our software, but we also create open source. So seven, if those who are developers here will know about GitHub, there are over 700 projects that we have contributed to that so that developers can take these tools and build their own solutions. The idea is to integrate this technology into systems uh, in an interoperable way. A couple different solutions that we've been highlighting here at this uh, trade show, at, at this um, expo, is ArcGIS Urban. It's a system for planning and managing urban development. It's an immersive technology, so it's not just being used for projects, but to uh, work on initiatives and plans enabling smarter cities by bringing all the stakeholders together into this immersive environment. Uh, so that they can plan scenarios much more easily than was possible before. Another solution is called Hub, ArcGIS Hub, and it's a system for enabling community engagement. It's connecting different communities of interest together, taking in open data, multiple formats, and working around initiatives like graffiti or crime or any number of initiatives. And it, it is a way to bring different stakeholders uh, together um, enabling um, them to be more connected as citizens, involving the citizenry in the planning and, and development of smart cities. Um, I've already said this, bringing people, organizations, and stakeholders together through the ESRI geospatial cloud. So in summary, applying geospatial technology for smart mobility, it's used for deriving insights from data. We have lots and lots of data, but how do we get insight out of it? to uncover patterns and trends, to gain greater location intelligence, and ultimately to make smarter decisions. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. Is there a city in the world that is not using GIS for oh, to manage mobility? That's a, because it's that's <laughs> a nice so question. In fact, our, our colleague who spoke uh, from India, uh, it turns out that he's our newest customer. Uh, I didn't know that we were working in that, in that uh, part of the world. But yeah, many uh, government uh, agencies do use uh, GIS, um, many different GIS providers out there. And uh, our goal is to work with them all. We realize that there's no one tool that meets everybody's needs. So we, we strive to be integrative and open to interoperate with whatever tools uh, cities have. Yeah. Yeah, there's a before and an after GIS with mobility management and planning, of course. Have you got any question the, from the audience? There must be some, yeah. Yeah, could you introduce yourself first? Oh, so there's another person behind, sorry. <laughs> so my name is uh, Jordi Hani, and I'm from the University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And my question is for the... Um, for the last speaker from Esri. I remember actually learning uh, ArcMap 3.1, or ArcGIS 3.1 back in the early 2000s. And I now teach in urban planning school and I, I teach students um, you know, basic GIS exercise. And what I've noticed is that most students are now moving to QGIS, which is, doesn't have a license and they can just get going right away. So my question actually is based on, on what you mentioned, is an open platform and, and I'm curious as how Esri is approaching the, yeah. this issue of I see a generational sh shift, although I don't know if, if, you, if you see that yourself, to away from uh, Esri, which was totally dominant you know, just 10 years yeah. ago. Yeah, thanks for your question. I wouldn't say that's actually correct. Uh, th there, we have a developer program, uh, which makes it really easy for uh, young people and old who want to build solutions with the components of GIS. 
and we've revamped that developer program to make it even easier. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Q QGIS, uh, QGIS uh, users using both. Um, there was an article that I just uh, read uh, yesterday from one of our partners that uses both open source and S3 technology, and the uh, the title of the of the article was "Why is it that open source is not killing S3?" Because the, if that's free, then why are we still growing? Well, the thing is, um, nothing in this world is really free. Uh, the total cost of ownership of building a solution, you may be able to get the software for nothing, but then you need to have support, and you need to have reliability. And so the cost of a consultant to implement those can be quite high. Where, uh, so there are communities of interest. We want to interoperate with them. We're not excluding open source. We're involved in open source. We use open source. So I wouldn't agree that the new generation of people are moving from one to the other. They coexist. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Uh, Tofi Khan, I'm from uh, City of Dallas, executive manager. Uh, quick question. You mentioned uh, multiple types of data. You talked about weather data. You talked about traffic data. You talked about life monitoring. How are you then collecting all these data? Is it a total solution of, um, you know, you have uh, detectors that detects a vehicle. You have detectors that detects micromobility or pedestrian. And then you have weather condition detector. Do you have a box solution, or you just use data that are existing uh, for the city, or you will help put in those radars or detectors for each solution? Yeah. So I suppose this is for S3. Yes. So we do have a marketplace. We do have uh, 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 a data business, but that's really not our core business. We bring data together as we can, as our customers contribute data, uh, or through partnerships, like uh, with here or TomTom. Uh, we make it easy for our customers to consume commercial data with bundling. But most of the data is open. And uh, we, uh, for example, uh, the, the cities, uh, we heard uh, from the uh, train operator, they made the uh, offer to make their data openly available. So we just want to make it easier for people to discover the data that's out there. There's so much data. How do you find it? It's like drinking from a, a fire hose. So we, our goal is to, is to just help people find that data. And then if it's free then, and it's open, then you're, you're, you're fri free to use it. But there's a lot of data that comes at quite a high cost. And you have to have relationships with those data providers. In some cases, it's licensing. In, in other cases, it's through bundling of other solutions. So there's no one box that does it all. Uh, but there is, with the Internet of Things, there's a flood of new data. And one of the things we want to do, what we do is uh, we make it easy to uh, develop um, APIs, application programmer interfaces, so no matter what format it is, you can get it. So it would be up to the cities to build those relationships or subscription, if it is not open source, to build a relationship with that data company, and then you would help us bundle it and analyze it. Yeah. Yeah, there are different scenarios. So if you think, for example, of here, a, a commercial company, they have taken uh, a patchwork of data from different localities and brought it together into a consistent uh, format. We do that as well. Um, but those data, those relationships between the data generators and, and the data users, there, there has to be some rules of engagement. And there has to be some metadata, right, which tells you about the data so that it's being used appropriately. And that's very, very important. So just data by itself uh, can be misused very easily if, it, if it's not well documented. So that's Thank key. you. Um, hello. Um, my name is Colin Lumsden. I'm from the Cayman Islands. Um, I'm an architect in the Cayman Islands, but I'm also a city manager for the capital city of Georgetown. Um, I'm also a user of ArcView 3.1 from the late <laughs> 90s. Um, so one of the hardest program, program I've ever used. Um, I'm currently using um, Archicad um, in, terms of, in terms of bit building information modeling. My question to you is not necessarily clear, but I just wanted to ask, um, I'm thinking about buying ArcView Urban. What are some of the um, ideas in, that I have to have in terms of um, making that decision? And also, is there any, um, uh, connection portal between ArcView and Archicad, um, yeah. which is probably the inventor of BIM, um, as I know it. 
Um, so again, my question is, what are some okay. of the... Um, so first of all, get ArcView out of your vocabulary. That That's really several generations old technology. and We want to make it easy for you to migrate from that to the new, more modern technology. So there are, there, you contact the ESRI representative for your region, and they will get you migrated. But there are, um, you said AutoCAD and ArcView? No, Arc, I use uh, ArchiCAD by Graphisoft. Oh, OK. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that one. But uh, there, there are a number of uh, migration paths that are available. And if, if, if you go to a web browser and put in a few keywords, you'll find people who've struggled with the th same thing that you're talking about right now. So uh, come see me at the ESRI booth after, and we'll help you through that. OK. Hello. My name is Florencia. I'm an urban planner. And my question is related to what are we doing with all the data? How are we analyzing it in the context of planning cities around a uh, mass transit network? So maybe it's uh, more directed to you, Silvia, as you're a decision maker and you're working for the government. So when you see this data that uh, service providers will give you, you see lines from point A for, uh, to point B, and you can see frequency and time, and etc. But are you? analyzing or are governments analyzing what's behind that data? Why are people taking that route? Why are people deciding to take the bike or walk or this means of transportation? Uh, what happens with uh, subjective well-being? What happens with the experience of people? Is that analyzed somewhere in the data? Yeah, well, I'm specialized in cycling uh, planning, but I also work before with pu public transport planning. I think we, we've got too, too much data. So we are not able, the people that are in charge of planning, sometimes we are not able of analyzing all the available data. Uh, in our metropolitan area, we've got a specific uh, department to, with GIS. You've got there some of my colleagues. And the people that are using GIS, especially are the, the in the mobility, um, in the urban planning. We are now developing the urban planning for the next years. And this is the team that is really having the time to analyze all the existing information and really plan for the future. But in the day-to-day -day planning or the day-to-day -day acting, we are not, I think we are not using the, the data as much as we, we should, because we, we just don't have the time to analyze all this information. So there's a, there's a, a long way to, to improve also and to, to work also together with the department. Maybe my colleagues have some other answer about what maybe you want to answer here. Microphone. Yes. Uh, oh. just uh, maybe ask you, who do you think should an, um, analyze this data? Is this a question of governance and maybe uh, asking the academia or making some new alliances with someone else to use this yeah. information in order to like uh, argument hmm. in, uh, for certain infrastructure or yeah, investment? Yeah. Of course, we are um, collaborating uh, with other uh, universities and so on. And also, we are analyzing like all the, in, in my case, the amount of cyclists that are uh, riding in, in some specific uh, streets. And that's very useful, especially to show the politicians that the investments are in the, in the good um, directions. So we use this data more to, for, the, yeah, for the decision making. But I think there's a lot of data that could be used. Uh, in order to plan better, and we are not able because yeah, we don't have the time and we don't have the, the big teams to analyze all this data. For instance, Ian was talking about Transport for London. I know they are a big uh, professional team uh, working with GIS in the, in the company. So I, th I don't think we are in this, in this point. We are also a uh, small, well, we are 700 employees for the 3.2 million of people. I think we've got more work than what we, yeah, like we've got this specific uh, department, which is very useful. I mean, they are always uh, thinking about how, how to use the GIS to, to make our lives easier. But I think there's a, a long way to, 
to go still. I don't know if you want to add something, no? Okay. Well, I, I want to make the point that universities and research institutes are very good resources um, because the, they have students that want to, want to develop their skills and to learn. And I, I think government is very open to working with uh, education institutions uh, to fill some of the gaps where they don't have enough employees to, mm -hmm. to do all of the, the research and, and, and analysis and work that needs to be done. So I really encourage that kind of collaboration between the educational, and not just universities, but we're finding that younger mm -hmm. people in, in schools where you have a teacher who has a passion for a subject uh, also is a very good resource uh, for, um, for, for, for working and understanding data, yeah. If you don't have other questions, I've got some questions for Clement as well. <laughs> I wanted to know, because autonomous vehicles, um, can, can they provide a better mobility option in terms of efficiency and flexibility than the existing bus and taxi services? Well, the thing is, uh, I'm convinced they will, okay. but in the future. At the time, we do not want to compete with a regular bus service or taxi service. We're not a taxi company anyway. Um, within the UITP, you know, the International Union of uh, Public Transport Operator, we truly believe that um, these services about robotaxi, let's say autonomous in the future, will only be a solution if they are shared. So we work um, on, on this uh, area as well to make it possible in the future. But at the time, we just need to provide a solution which is a complement of the actual service. I'm convinced personally that we'll have a fleet of robotaxi somewhere, shared robotaxi, just to decrease congestion, etc. That could be at some point a competition with taxi, but that's not the main point uh, today. We want to provide a public service, and we offer these solutions shared once again uh, to our passengers. And do you think public transport authorities are the best institution to make public transport coordinated and consistent? Uh, I think so, uh, for many different reasons. Well, first of all, it's our main clients, but um, we believe that uh, to avoid um, some, you know, um, very, very bad um, possibilities we have. For instance, uh, let's think about fleet of autonomous robot taxi with no passengers on board, just doing some advertising in the city, which means more vehicle in the city, more congestion. To avoid that, we are convinced that local authorities, it could be at the city level, region level, national level, depending on the country, will be the one um, in charge of regulation. Mm -hmm. Some people are also thinking about uh, licensing the autonomous mobility uh, services. That's an option, like they did for the telecommunication, for instance, just to be sure that safety is there and that we provide a solution that go in the right direction to reduce congestion, pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a point because you always need, at least for until the moment, an, another person in the in the vehicle. Yes. So in the end, we are changing the driver for a person that is also offering services and information. And what's the point then? Because we are not saving money with saving drivers. So, but are we offering a better service, or is it like more reliable or more safe? What's the point? Let's assume it's safer, uh, though, of course, we have very strict rules for the drivers. Uh, but an autonomous vehicle, it's basic, but we never get tired, we never get drunk, etc. So safety could be an option. But uh, when I say could be, that's because at the time, it's still um, a vehicle with a safety driver on board. We work to make it possible, but uh, we have to study all the safety aspects. Because at the time, the safety driver is okay here to welcome the people, but also to anticipate some dangers, to better understand the technology. But in the future, we are convinced that we'll find an option. And if you are also worrying about the, um, the jobs, because I guess the majority of our workforce is made of drivers, I would just, put, um, uh, just talk about the example of the automated subway. 
um, we are moving the subway from uh, with a driver to automated subway, like in Lyon, for instance, and we operate these services from uh, more than 30 years now. The thing is, it's a step-by-step -step approach. The first driver we had in 2016 in our autonomous shuttle is now the official trainer of the other drivers. So he, he make an evolution in his career. No, I mean, not everyone will do that, but we are working closely with the human resources department to make it possible. And using a step-by-step -step approach, some people will be happy to move to this supervision activity, maintenance, and some other will stay in the regular buses. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to finish. It's time for the chair, Uriel Balaguer, to finish the session. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, I think this afternoon we have uh, a very interesting conclusions of this meeting. Uh, in the case of Silvia, he said three challenges, very important ones, the eco-friendly solutions against the um, climate emergency is not a, a, a question of outside. It's not a problem of mobility. We have another problem today, and this is a very important uh, necessity for our cities. The second problem or the second challenge is the public-private collaboration that you say. Uh, all of the table is, today is all the time speaking about public and private and how to manage these solutions. And the last key question that you open minds is the technology, no? We, we expect that the technology will we have solutions for all the problems that we have. Only uh, a question for all. We are speaking in the first world. Perhaps we must to think more about the other worlds. Yes. I live in Bogota. It's the big city in the world that don't have metro, for example. Yeah? And I think there is people from other places, and it's clear that the solutions uh, m must to build solutions thinking about all the world, not only the technological place that we live. Lola Ortiz, the second uh, speaker who lives before, it's just arriving to Madrid, uh, the responsibilities. He has an interesting program now, 360 uh, solution. And in fact, Madrid, like Barcelona, knows that the solution is not only mobility, it's at the same time contamination and other dimensions of the problem. In the case of Kliman, of work, uh, I was fascinated of your intervention because for a lot of time, as a client of transport, we dream about the autonomous model. But one thing is to dream, another to live and use the models. No? I think you, you, you say the keys, no? the safety, and this is a very important question for Barcelona. It, now uh, we have this in, in, in our minds in the metro and the underground, that we have lines working around and no problems. That means there is solutions. The second question that you say is not only a problem of distance last mile. You, in the last intervention, you see something very important. It's not only a problem of technology. There is a lot of people working there, drivers, taxis. It's a social problem for the future. And that means we, we must to build solutions working together with the people who is there involved. And this is a very key question, in, in my opinion. And we know we have experience as a city with these conflicts. The third question is, the clients, the custom acceptability, because we, we are people, technological people here. But you can think the last mile for the old people or the ch children and how to manage this kind of different peoples in these solutions. Because it's not only a problem of driver, when a, children, uh, a child arrives to the bus autonomous and go in, uh, but they are jugging, uh, jugging with other children and how does it mean? And the last question is regulation, regulation, regulation. Uh, walk around Barcelona these days is a crazy situation that 10 years ago we can imagine. And this is not the case of Barcelona. It's the case in, in, in Colombia, in Spain, in, in Peru, in Brazil. We have a little bit crazy situation for our mobility and it's time of regulate and have commitments about. 
And for the last talk of Jan, uh, the cloud is our uh, inspiration, you know, because you have solutions for a lot of questions from the first world, but for the third world. Eh? Because this is one of the questions that I listen to you, I, I was thinking about. Yeah. When I remember some places around the world that there is not telecommunications, only have a possibilities of satellite, and how these kind of solutions can uh, discover new challenges and new solutions for this kind of people to have the same opportunities in the same world. Thank you very much. And uh, we expect that you come back to this Congress next year, 10 year of the Congress, I think. Okay. Thank you very much.